We want to welcome all those who are worshiping with us this day, everyone gathered here in our fellowship hall and folks who are joining us for worship online. We are so glad that you can be here with us. Hopefully all of our tech works today, but we're in a different setup. So bear with us if we have any issues at all. Um, but I think we got things set up okay. Um, looking at what we have going on this week, today after worship, we do have our pancake breakfast to support our emergency assistance fund. So thank you everyone for gathering here. If there's anyone worshiping at home who feels like getting out and coming over for lunch afterwards, you're of course welcome to join us for that. Tomorrow evening at 6 p.m., our grief group will meet in the Zion room. Tuesday at 5.30 p.m., our worship team is going to be meeting on Zoom, and we're meeting on Tuesday this month because this Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and so we do have our Ash Wednesday worship service in the sanctuary at 7 p.m. That's going to be offered both in person and online. Um, look for an email this Wednesday for folks worshiping with us at home with the work for the worship materials, and if you do know you'll be worshiping with us at home um, and want to go ahead and pick up some ashes so that you can follow along during the service. We do have some baggies over there so you can take those home with you. Um, and when we do the imposition of ashes, then you can participate in that part of the service. But we hope that you'll join us this Ash Wednesday. This Wednesday which is Valentine's Day at 7 p.m. in the sanctuary or online. Throughout the season of Lent, um, our series is going to be, What Are You Up To? And we are considering all those things Jesus is asking us to be up to in his name. And we hope that it will be an uplifting season. There's so much pain and hurt and chaos in this world, and sometimes it can really get us down. Um, so we are seeking after those things that help up uplift our spirits so that we have um, the energy and the enthusiasm we need to do God's work in this world. Um, regular Wednesday services for Lent are going to be offered online this year after Ash Wednesday. Um, so we will be sending those out in our emails so you can worship with us on Facebook or YouTube. Um, this Wednesday, uh, the RSVP for our third Sunday lunch is also due. So next Sunday after worship, we're heading to Tianfu. They have Japanese, Chinese, Thai, and a few other things sprinkled in there as well. Um, delicious food. Um, I'm in charge of the lunch this month, so it would be a big help to me just right now if we had a show of hands of folks who plan on attending that lunch. So I at least have a ballpark um, to try to make a reservation. Okay, I was like, it's just going to be me and Debbie, but okay. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, ten. Did I count myself? Eleven. Did I count myself? Twelve. I'm going to estimate. 12 right now. Um, if you decide you do want to join us, just let me know before Wednesday. I want to make sure we give them a heads up. Last time we had like two really big full tables. Um, so I want to prepare the folks there. Um, and then one more thing this week, Thursday, our Golden Friends Ministry is meeting here in the Fellowship Hall at 2 p.m. That's our seniors ministry. We're going to be getting together for games and snacks. So seniors, bring your favorite game to play and bring a snack to share. We're trying to keep things as simple as possible. We'll have cards, of course, if you want to do Euchre. I'm going to hopefully have a chance to go pick up some board games from my brother. That will be um, easy enough for me to be able to understand the directions because it takes a little bit sometimes with some of these board games, but hopefully some fun games. Um, so bring a game, bring a snack. We'll be here Thursday at 2 p.m. That's the third third Thursday of the month is when we try to meet. So that's what we have going on this week at Zion. I know that is quite a bit, but I hope that you can join us for some of what um, some of what is happening. 
A couple of um, other notes, as you came in today on our entryway table, you will have seen that we have that all church calendar available for you to pick up. Um, that was also available in the email, I believe. We have a Lenten journal for you to use throughout the season of Lent. It is a daily journal that relates to the worship series that we're doing. That was also emailed out if you'd rather use a digital copy of that. And then we do have copies of our annual report available as well. Also was emailed out to our members list this past Saturday. Um, the online version is better because you can see the color and all the photos, uh, but just cost of printing is a lot. So we printed out black and white, but if you're able to take a peek at the online version, you can see all the photos in color. So those are items for you to pick up today. Um, just a couple other updates uh, for building access. Greg Law has kindly taken over um, building access and door access. Um, I'm grateful that that is off my plate now. So if you need um, access to the edge building in particular, if your um, ministry team has something going on, a meeting, if you have events happening, Greg's going to be the one um, who's going to set our door schedule. Um, so see Greg if you have any questions about that, we're going to work together at keeping up to date with our weekly schedule. And then the Parsonage team, just a quick update, has been interviewing um, realtors and our team is Terry, Greg Law, and Cindy Yenna. Um, if you do want to be part of that team, you are welcome um, to do so, but they've been working hard. Um, our lease is almost up and so there's going to be lots and lots happening with that. Those are the announcements I want to lift up to you today. I know that was a lot. Uh, so thank you for listening and thank you for all the ways that you all make all of this ministry happen. Uh, let's ready our hearts for worship today. Martha's going to play for us our prelude. Uh, Jesus, the very thought of thee. <laughs> Worship today, I'd like to invite you to join in a responsive call to worship. Uh, when I point to you, you are invited to say, God will not leave us. Let's practice that. God will not leave us. Okay. As we live and as God lives, God will not leave us. When fire devours and storms blow us astray, God will not leave us. When truth is veiled and confusion reigns, God will not leave us. When the world changes around us, God will not leave us. 
When we long to speak, but find no words, God will not leave us. When all around us is silent, God will not leave us. When faithfulness feels beyond us, as we live and as God lives, we worship the one who will not leave us. Friends, you're invited to join us in our gathering hymn. It is number 51, How Great Thou Art. If you are comfortably able and feel called to do so, you are invited to stand for this one. It is number 51, How Great Thou Art. be seated. Let us pray. O 
Holy One, when the world is full of confusion and your message is hard to perceive, still we see you. Still your presence shines, a light to illuminate the shadows. When we cannot find a way to speak your story, let your being shine in us and through us, that we may reflect your glory and your grace. God, as we come to you in worship this day, you know those prayers that we just named. God, today especially, we pray for the family and friends and loved one and church family of Bill McLaughlin during this time of loss. We ask for your comfort and your care to be poured out on all of those who are touched by this loss, that your grace and your comfort might cover them. God, we give you thanks that in Jesus Christ, we know the fullness of life. We give you thanks that his light shined in this world, that we might know that this life is not the end but that in you is eternal glory and honor. God, as we come to you too, we lift up all those in our church family who are going through some challenging times, who are in need of your healing care and your presence, who are looking for your calm and your comfort in the storm. May your love and care be poured out upon them. We pray for transitions in life, for those who are getting ready for surgeries and other big things, for those who are pouring out their comfort and care as caregivers, for those who have reason to celebrate and bring their joy this day. God, we lift them up to you. God, we pray that you bless our ministry here at Zion, that we might do your work in this world, that your light might extend far and wide, that others might witness to the glory that we have seen in you. God, bless this worship as we gather today. We lift up all these prayers to you in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen I'd like to invite our choir to come forward. They are going to sing for us, Love Grows Here. See you. 
Thank you to our choir for that beautiful gift. That could almost be our theme song here at Zion because love grows here indeed. Um, we have folks from all walks of life at all stages in life and seasons here at Zion. And it is wonderful that God brings us together in such a beautiful way and allows love to grow and flourish here among us. For our exploring together time today, we are doing what we have been doing, and that is little word association with our star word of the day. Um, so here at Zion, way back on Epiphany Sunday at the beginning of January, we all received star words that we could use in our prayer life and in our everyday spiritual practice to help connect us to God in maybe some new and different Different ways as we reflected on that theme of whatever our star word was. Um, and so we have been taking a word from our like overall star word list um, and applying that to the scriptures that we've been looking at this season. Today, we are going to be looking at the story of the transfiguration, um, and that is a story filled with all kinds of beautiful light and glory. Um, Jesus heads to the mountaintop to connect with God, and there the prophets Moses and Elijah appear with him. And so the word that I picked out for today is radiate. So one of the things that we can do with our star words is just some simple word association to kind of get the ideas flowing. So when you hear the word radiate, what is it that you think of? You're invited to share that now. Glow. Glow. Oh, I like that. Glow. Warmth. Warmth. Anybody else? Sunbeams. Sunbeams. Oh, yes. I like that image. Just thinking bright. Bright. Yeah. Going out, some action in there. I like it. Anyone else? I will admit when I was doing this exercise myself, I kept thinking of our boiler system here at church and the radiators that send the warmth out for us and how grateful I am for that uh, during these cold months. Radiate, it's got lots of meaning. So light, um, that idea of this warmth and that glow, that idea of something being sent out. So it is a rich word and we are going to explore it more. So thank you for sharing your thoughts with all the star words that we have been working our way through. Um, I hope they've been a good exercise for you this season um, to think about God and faith, your own life in some new and different ways to see things perhaps um, with some new lenses on. Um, so we're going to explore Radiate a little bit more. But first, I'd like to invite Colin to come forward and read for us our scripture. It is Mark 9, verses 2 through 13. This is the Transfiguration story. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud came a voice. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. 
Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead could mean. Then they asked him, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He said to them, Elijah is indeed coming first to restore all things. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he is to go through many sufferings and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased as it is written about him. Thank you, Colin. Let us pray. Glorious and wondrous God, it is good that your good news has been proclaimed this day, that we might hear the message that you have for us. God, open our hearts to your wonder, to your light shining bright this day. Help us to see with fresh eyes. Help us to draw nearer to Christ. Help us to be inspired by all that he did and he taught. God, we pray that this time of study might be a blessing to us. And I pray that the words of your servant are ever faithful. Amen. Friends, let's jump right into it. Um, just as we've been doing with all of our star words, we are going back to good old Merriam Webster to look at the definition of what this word means. So we're looking at the definitions for radiate. This exercise especially has reminded me of how complicated language is and how all words have all of these different meanings. Even if those differences seem subtle, they can be significant. It just reinforces how interpreting what others communicate, how interpreting scripture is really pretty complicated because we each bring a unique perspective and understanding to each word and each combination of words. We all have our default definitions for things that we fall back on. And we've just been looking at English words um, for our star words. So imagine how more, much more complicated it is when trying to translate scriptures from a different language and different culture and different context into our own language. That's just an observation, a little aside, but it has been a humbling reminder doing this exercise to remember how our understanding is always partial and incomplete. So radiate, according to Merriam-Webster as a verb, means to proceed in a direct line or toward a center. It can also mean to send out rays, to shine brightly. It can mean to irradiate or illuminate. As an adjective, it gets a little more mathy into the territory of geometry, if you will, meaning having rays or radial parts, such as characterized by radial symmetry or radi no, radially symmetrical. Oh, that gives me flashbacks to sophomore year geometry. I think there's something to explore there, but maybe not so much today. But that first definition kind of relates to that last one. It's not as intensely mathy, um, but it has this idea of a direct line that moves from or towards a center point. So if I remember like any of my math, I think this is right. Um, on a plane, if you have one point, then wherever a line goes from it, it can connect back to it. So you're moving on your X axis and your Y axis. I don't remember something like that, but that idea, it all connects back to that center point. 
for us as disciples of Christ, Christ is the center of our lives. Our faith is that direct line we have that continually pulls us back to the one who reveals the fullness of God to us. No matter how far we move from that center point, we can find our way back. That's a new way for me to think about what it means for God's love to radiate from Christ to us. And I hated math class so much, but it finally came in handy a little bit. Of course, with the transfiguration story, I paired this particular star word with our scripture because of that meaning to send out rays and to shine brightly or to illuminate. That's one of the main exercises that we are doing with our star words, of course, is a connecting them to a scripture. In the most wonderful, mysterious way, Jesus lit up on the top of that mountain, immersed in the glory of God. The scripture kind of throws out there that the prophets Moses and Elijah are also there on the mountain. Moses, who also shone brilliantly after he spent time with God on his own mountain, And Elijah, the one who didn't die, but who ascended into heaven and whose return is still anticipated, there they are talking with Jesus. It's hard to overemphasize how incredibly important the prophets were and are to the Jewish faith, to Jesus' faith. It was through the prophets that God's saving word was proclaimed. It was through the prophets that God called people back to their center. It was through the prophets that repentance and grace were made known and God's will revealed. The transfiguration story then directly connects Jesus to this long line of prophets who came before him. And this moment confirms that God is doing something bolder and brighter through Jesus than God has ever done before. This is my son, God declares. The beloved, listen to him. There can be no doubt that this is the Savior, the Messiah, the one God's people had been waiting for. The disciples had in them this awe-inspired fear when they encountered the glory of God up on that mountain as they had never seen it before. It changed them forever. This is where it helps to have a good study Bible with all of those footnotes, because this scripture connects not only backwards to the stories of Moses and Elijah, but also forwards to how Peter's story will unfold. My footnotes then point me to 1 Peter 1, 16 through 19, to reveal the lasting impact this encounter had on his life. Peter writes this in 1 Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves, Peter writes, heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Clearly, Peter had spent quite a bit of time reflecting on what that transfiguration moment meant for him and for his faith and his ministry. He wanted to take that moment and let that light continue to radiate out to others. That mountaintop moment strengthened that line of faith that would connect 
Peter back to the center that he had found in Christ. They caused him to go out and to extend to others what had been revealed to him in that awe-inspiring moment. From then on, he would allow the glory of God to radiate through his own life and ministry, shining brightly in dark places. Another way that we can go deeper with our star words is to recall a story that relates to that word. It can be a book, a movie, or a TV show like last week, even a K-drama. It can be a story from your own life or from your family. It can be someone else's story. Anything that helps us gain some insight into this star word. Radiate. Of all the star words that we've looked at, this one has stumped me the most in trying to think of a story to explore that exemplifies this word. And connecting it though with the transfiguration story, with this mountaintop experience, it hit me of course, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his mountaintop speech. And the way God's love and God's glory radiated through King and his work. It's Black History Month, so it's the perfect time to explore King's story and this person who had such a profound and lasting impact on our country and the world. I think that King's role has been diluted as a public figure. He's primarily presented in the realm of politics, and we celebrate the tremendous work that he did for civil rights and how he led a nonviolent movement that made this country better by fighting so that others might see the value and dignity and worth of Black people in the United States. I say that we dilute his role, though, because too often we forget his why. We fail to mention that first and foremost, he was a pastor and a preacher. We ignore that so much of his public speaking wasn't just speeches, but they were sermons. We don't talk about where he learned about human dignity and that everyone's voice matters and that the color of your skin doesn't make you less than. He learned that from the faith of his grandmothers from the church, from the Bible, from Jesus. King was continually strengthening that radial line that brought him back to his center, to Christ. He was reminding those he worked with all the time that God was at the center of this work. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a modern prophet of sorts, naming truth to power, calling a nation to repent its sins, showing us that there was another way. Like Moses, his cry was to let my people go. His aim was to lead his people to freedom in the promised land. On April 3rd, 1968, in Tennessee, King spoke to sanitation workers who were facing life-threatening injustices, especially Black workers. Garbage men who were underpaid and mistreated and forced to work in unsafe conditions, harassed because of their race, who were dehumanized and whose worth was denied. It all came to a head when one worker was crushed to death by a malfunctioning truck and people were ready to say that enough is enough. It was time to organize and to enact change to take a stand for a better, more loving way. In this particular moment, King talks about the problems of Pharaoh. He lifts up the words of the prophet Amos and how he called for justice to roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. He reminds people that when Jesus set out to do God's work, Jesus had declared that he was anointed to bring good news to the poor always. Always, King's work was grounded in his faith, informed by God's word, and done so that God's glory might be revealed. As King spoke on that April 3rd, 
Threats against his life loomed large because there were many whose hatred trumped all else, who didn't want the status quo disturbed, who were more interested in preserving their own power than recognizing the worth of God's beloved. At the end of the speech that night, King recalls how costly God's work in this world can be. He talks about how he had been stabbed when he was in New York, and had he sneezed, the knife would have gone in just a tiny little bit different than his aorta would have been punctured, and surely he would have died. He talks, too, about how his plane from Atlanta to Tennessee that morning had to be guarded and the whole plane checked because of threats against his life. He was already very familiar with the damage that bombs could do. King knew the work that he was doing could cost him his life and that living out his faith and his call could mean death. And he had to decide if he would let this dampen his light or if he would go on to radiate God's good news. Those who were fighting for justice, for basic freedoms and rights, for the values of democracy in this country, they also had to decide how far they would go because their lives and safety were under threat too. This is how King ends that speech to those sanitation workers who longed for a better life. I don't know what will happen, he said. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned with that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountaintop. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eye has seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. That was the end of his speech. Do you hear that blessed assurance in what King says? His walk with Christ was so close. His relationship with God was his guide. He made his aim in life to do God's will. He had encountered the glory of God on the mountaintop. And so he had found his peace, his joy, his happiness. And no matter the circumstances that would work before him, that would not change. Having been transformed by God's glory, he decided to let his light radiate, to not let any fear or any threat put out the light of God shining through him. The next morning, he was assassinated leaving behind his wife and his four children and a movement full of people longing for freedom and for God's glory to be revealed. King was just 39 years old when his life was taken. He had lived a full, rich life dedicated to God's work. He made every moment that he could count. Because of that, God's light continues to radiate from his legacy. He continues to impact those who study his ministry and learn from his faith. I certainly know that my life and ministry have been profoundly influenced by King's prophetic witness. What is it for us to let God's light radiate? What is it for us to encounter the glory of God up on that mountaintop and to let it change our lives? The other thing that we've been doing with our star words is finding quotes related to them. Again, it was hard to find quotes on this word radiate, but I did find one that I liked. It's by a man named Panash Desai. I think that's how you say it. He's a writer and a coach. And he said this, radiate your light, even if it's too bright for those around you, 
Your presence is making a difference. Radiate your light, even if it's too bright for those around you, your presence is making a difference. The next one is not a quote, but a poem. And I'm cheating here because it doesn't have the word radiate in it, but instead it has the word radiant, right? So those are close. I think they have the same Latin root to them, right? Radiate, radiant. This poem is transfiguration and is about the transfiguration. And so we're just gonna say that it counts. It's by Madeline Lingle from her poem, Glimpses of Grace. Here's what she wrote. Suddenly they saw him the way he was, the way he really was all the time, although they had never seen it before. The glory which blinds the everyday eye and so becomes invisible. This is how he was, radiant, brilliant, carrying joy like a flaming sun in his hands. This is the way he was, is from the beginning, and we cannot bear it. So he manned himself, came manifest to us. And there on the mountain, they saw him, really saw him, saw his light. We all know that if we really see him, we die. But isn't that what is required of us? Then perhaps we will see each other too. Friends, the closer you walk with Christ, the more you soak in the glory and wonder of God, the greater your commitment to doing God's will, the more God's light will radiate through your life. The world needs your light. Your presence is making a difference. So go forth and radiate. Amen. Friends, in response to the glory and wonder of God that we have encountered up on this mountaintop, we are going to sing hymn number 658. It is Awesome God. It's just the chorus to this song that is in our hymnals. And so we're going to sing it through two times. Number 658, the chorus to Awesome God. another, we share our gifts out of our abundance. As you bring your gifts this day, you are welcome to place them in the offering basket in the back. You can mail things to the office or you can donate online at zionuccindy.net where you'll find our PayPal donate button. Our February Benevolence Offering goes to support our church's wider mission. At Zion United Church of Christ, we are not alone in the work that we do. As part of the UCC, we are connected to a bigger, wider church family through covenantal relationship that holds our ministry in prayer and offers resources for us to do God's work. Our wider church family also witnesses to God's love right here in our own Indiana, Kentucky conference and across the world. 
Your support of OCWM Benevolence Offering allows this important work to continue and strengthens our relationship with the wider church. So do consider supporting OCWM this month. Friends, whatever gifts you have to bring this day, no matter how big or small, of your resources, of your time, of your talent, we are grateful for them, and they will be used to do God's work in this world and to let God's light shine. If you are comfortably able, you are invited to stand as we sing together our doxology. You'll find it on our screen. You're welcome to sing whichever version is most meaningful to you. You're invited to rise now. lift up our hearts in thanksgiving to God as we dedicate these gifts. Let us pray. Mighty God, you live and you do not leave us. With these gifts, we do not leave each other. God, use them that they might bring glory to this ministry, that through them your light may shine. God, we give you thanks for your presence among our ministry and that your presence will be made known through what is given this day. We lift up to you these gifts and all those who give. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 106, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 106, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, another wonderful hymn to lift up our hearts as we bask in the glory and wonders of our Savior, Jesus Christ.
sent forth today, we do want to lift up a blessing for our meal. First of all, we are so grateful to everyone who's donated food and helped with setup and folks who've been cooking and everyone who's going to help with clean up too. We are so grateful um, for all that you have contributed. This breakfast this year is going to support our emergency assistance fund here at Zion United Church of Christ. There's a donation basket at the end of the table for you to share your gifts. This is an important ministry of our church here at Zion. Um, before the Franklin Township Ministerial Association used to have this voucher program where if someone came to our church for gas or groceries, all I had to do was fill out a voucher and we had partners we could send them to where they could go get what they needed. And that funding was supported by several of our churches in the Ministerial Association. The Ministerial Association doesn't really function that much anymore. And so that is why we created this emergency assistance fund here at Zion. So when people call, email, send me a Facebook message, whatever, um, and they have a need, I am able to say yes to them. And we can support them through a time of crisis. For many of them, it is something scary and new that they've never gone through before. And and you all yourselves, I'm sure, have been feeling the strain of this economy with rising utilities, with the cost of groceries going up. All of these things add up so much, um, especially for folks who are already in hard circumstances. And so this is what these funds are for. And you are invited to share your gifts um, by placing them in the basket at the end of our table. Friends, let us bless our meal. I invite you to join me in prayer. God, we give you thanks for the bounty of this meal of which we are about to partake. For all those who are making this meal happen, God, we give you our thanks. For those who grew the food that we are about to share, for those who prepared it, for those who are serving it, God, we lift them up to you. God, bless this meal that it might nourish our bodies and our spirits. God, we give you thanks for this opportunity to gather at your table where your light shines so bright. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Friends, people of God, as God has shined life into you, as you have witnessed it, you are invited to go forth now and to let God's light shine through you. Go forth to shine and to radiate. Amen.